Game on everybody! Division S and, well, Europe, obviously. Disgusting against the Vikings. Okay, let's go. Uh, right now, we have our first map and it is Cursed Hollow. Which is always a little bit of a highlight, to be absolutely honest with you. I love Cursed Hollow. Great map, always a lot of fun, and I'm excited for it. So, we'll find out who is taking the lead in this best of five series. Disgusting, of course, pretty much all the way down at the bottom of the standings right now. The team made it very, very late into the season in the first place. And then one of the teams that they had the best chances to beat go next actually disbanded, so they're currently on seventh place. And, I mean, for them it's difficult, because they just barely made it into Division S, and one of the reasons why they actually made it in was also that another team, before the season started, actually withdrew because they said, well, we're basically just stopping to play Heroes of the Storm, nothing left, and therefore there was another spot open. Disgusting has been fighting as much as they could, and honestly, they had a couple of good showings too, won a few maps there, and just generally speaking, they are not on a position yet where they have the experience to break through the ranks, and that's a problem for them. So with that, we're going to see what exactly they can still pull off here. Um, but yeah, so... Um I mean, right now, I'm honestly just a little bit interested to see how the drafting is going to run for them, because Abyssa, as a ban, is already mixing things up a little bit. When you're looking at Cursed Hollow, there's, of course, a couple of elements that immediately come into it. <laughs> ban against Zaratulia. Uh, just simply because Globals are great on the map, and also control over... That's an interesting ban, actually. Make is currently not here for the Vikings, so they're playing without Make. Make is apparently on vacation in Spain, uh, as he told me, so they ban out Mephisto regardless. But as I was about to say, usually on the ban pattern you see Globals banned out uh, on this map. Also boss control is of course important, so some heroes like Falstad, like Tyriel, also have more value in the right team composition. If you pair Tyriel up with a Greymane, for example, there's a lot of engage that you can get out of that sanctification if it's placed properly during a fight. But we have completely different spans from what I expected. Already starting things off with that Abathar and that Zeratul ban is highlighting that Vikings just have a bit of the respect for Disgusting's melee assassin performance. But Anna as a first pick, highlighting that they at least want to get that mage in. And, well, what exactly is Disgusting opening things up with? Because again, ah, still limbing away, so Jaina is open for the Vikings, and we have ETC, so stage dive as a possibility, depending on the rest of the lineup, if they want to have that global. So that's one. And what else do we have now? Uh, I mean, I would expect Jaina to be picked now. If you want to combo Ana with something, you have pretty much at this point two chances, or two heroes that really jump out. Malthael, if you go for Tormented Souls, and Jaina, of course. Now, there's a few others that you can also combo it off with, but you don't see it all that often. Gul'dan, for example, that's most of a hero that you see either picked on Tomb of the Spider Queen, or, on the other hand, on Infernal Shrines, of course. But there's Jaina, as expected, and Max Passion gets the Panda into play. <laughs> Top cake plays all day, every day. That's exactly what we're going to see here again. And let's jump in on the bands. What is disgusting going to get rid of right now? I mean, frontline. Malganis. All right. Honestly, I was personally expecting for them to maybe even ban out Johanna here. Since Backhold, a.k.a. Burger. Now, he, he picked up Malganus, of course, too, but the heroes that he's known for is his Johanna, his Tyriel, and also his Garrosh. So I thought that we would more so see one of those heroes banned out. Then again, he plays Malganus, too, and has played Malganus quite a bit. And if you get a good setup with Malganus so that Jaina can take aim here, that's, of course, worth a lot, too. So uh, probably not really a... Not necessarily a bad ban by any means. Support gets a bit targeted from the red team as they're banning out Malfurion. Yeah, but with Liming... I wouldn't be surprised if we see Falls that's still coming in here, but it's Hanzo and it's Lucio! Okay! Lucio's trying to jam it up again. Ah. I mean, it's good for the rotations. He can be quite annoying on this map. Through all those small corridors, he gets a lot of wall rides in. So we've seen that from Ixia in particular, playing for Crystal Gaming, how much of a nuisance Lucio can be. Gets even target bands against him. But right now, this is still going to become dangerous. 100%. He 
Yes, because here we go. <laughs> Greyman and Garrosh. Dangerous indeed. A lot of burst damage and there is not a lot of safety nets on the blue team side. The sound barrier is pretty much the only thing that they can reliably uh, cast now in an attempt to keep the team alive. So that will make things difficult. Mirrodin comes in as the main tank. So we have ETC in the side lane, which makes the pick into the mosh pit even less likely. He's very, very likely going to go into that stage dive and try to add, add a global macro aspect to their composition here. But with game number one now set up, let's jump in. The Vikings, ladies and gentlemen, in the best of five in Division S Europe, going up against the Disgusting. Game number one! Disgusting! On the left side, in blue, with Lavakal, on Li Ming, Sartos on ETC, Itrax on Hanzo, Birch on Murden and Rutek on Lucio. And on the right side, the Vikings with Max Passion on Chen. We have Galnagulnar on Anna, Skok on Jaina, Gia on Greymane, and Burger, aka Backhold, on Garrosh. Alright, let's go. No new talent, by the way. The new block talent not taken advantage of by Muradin. Third Wind instead is his weapon of choice on level 1. Could have definitely gone into uh, the newly reform talents here, considering that Greymane is on the other side, so that was definitely an option for them, one that they didn't use now. Bit of a wrap around at the bottom of the map, everybody's trying to see who rotates down. That is a trap that is gonna result in them losing experience if they... okay, they, they give it up for now. They were hoping for an early rotation, which isn't the case here, because yeah, if they just stand there, then they have an issue. But... There's even a little bit more action. The hammer hits and it hits hard, but it's not enough to drop the panda. Okay, so far so good. Yeah, decent setup here. Well played by them. In the sense that, first of all, the red team of course survives. Blue team was trying something new, setting up a trap. I appreciate the initiative and the idea, but it didn't quite work out here. Didn't lose anything because of that, so yeah. It's not really like it's a huge problem or anything. So as we look at our little setup, we have already Muradin sitting in the middle of the map. Alone, by the way. Shouldn't really be in that spot. And Jaina is starting to work on the Siege Giants over here. So Jaina has already taken advantage of her AoE and drops those quickly. Shrine, or oh sorry, the Tribute spawns at the top side. So she could actually even wait with grabbing this, but we're going to see early aggression from them through that. Whereas Hanzo has already moved straight up to the top left as well. So he's taking the Siege Giants for them now too. And I'm going to try and get a bit of a setup with this done. Yeah, top right, that's where we have still our one versus one. It's actually an interesting setup here. The main tank is here in position against ETC. For now, it's totally fine for Backhold. And this is, of course, what he's aiming for having that quick flip into tower range and then it's done. Sartorius gets out pretty easily, but he still eats some damage, so there's that. Down to the bottom of the map, Muradin is the one trying to stack his baseline quest a bit more, but so far he only connected two Storm Balls, so it didn't really get a whole lot done on the level 1 talent. Yeah, ETC has a slide out as well, after Backhold threw him in once again, so gotta be careful on that front too. And here with level 4 talents now, the first objective is soon going to be announced, and the teams can then start to fight for exactly that. So... There we have it. Our little tiny setup in the middle with the camp colliding. A little bit of a stun coming through too. Nice, so far. And well, let's see if they can actually do a little bit more with that, especially up at the top. This is going to be the interesting one. Now that we have the tribute actually about to spawn on the map, there is definitely a big opportunity for a bit of a fight that could oh Chen actually down at the bottom of the map. Yep, sorry, that rotation of Liming did quite a bit of work here apparently. It was a nice setup apparently against uh, Muradin, so I think the two went just up against each other's throat and then all of a sudden you have that one rotation and that's that just lights out. But up to the top it's a bit of a different story. Over here where the tribute spawns, this is now all about positioning and all about the attempt to go in for a kill. Talking about kills, could even be a one against Gia if he doesn't pay attention. Triumph rate for Li Ming, by the way. The level 4 adjustments. Still expect, of course, Calamity. Uh, Muradin jumps in. Gets immediately flipped over. But there's the Stormbolt follow-up. Nice. Good damage against Backhold. Seriously. That was a really nice setup. First ETC power slide. Then Muradin following it up with a stun. But ETC still falls. As we have Greymane and Chen committing to that fight. Very aggressive heroes, of course. When both of them jump onto the same target. And you always have to follow up damage from... Uh, yeah, from Jaina, and that's just a ton. 
And we are talking uh, without nano boost so far. Later on, of course, it's going to become even more dangerous going up against that. But the interrupts are still there. Lucio comes even in to uh, secure another one. So far, the tribute hasn't been channeled yet. But it's getting damn close. They might have to trade back hold for it, and they do. Garrosh is down. But if everybody else can jump out, well, the panda dies as well. So it's a tribute against two hero kills. Oh, but the counter kill Greyman. Ha oh, ha ha. He wants more and he gets more. Is able to take down Lucio and also Murdin. And nearly with a cocktail getting the dex extra damage in against Itrax. Yeah, I feel like this at this point the blue team was just a bit too greedy. You know, they just looked at it and they said like, well, maybe we can actually make that play now. If we can jump in and take them down here, that might just be it. But as it turns out, it was a little bit too much to ask for. Should have probably stopped after the initial two kills. Grey Mage took advantage of the low HP pools and that's all that they needed here. So Calamity has been picked on level 7 as usual. We have still the heavy impact taken, so the slows were increased quite heavily from Muradin. And that gives you a lot of control over those fights. When you jump in deep. So Muradin didn't go for the level 1 talent, but he still picks the 7 for Dwarf launch. And is playing around that. And, well, let's see if this is going to be enough for them. There's another easy channel down here. Nobody seems to be willing to interrupt that. It's a good position for the red, for the blue team as well. It's three kills versus three kills now. That could change soon, though. Top lane, Muradin nearly gets caught by that little gank that was set up by the Vikings. Couldn't quite get dropped, though. And there's, of course, also the cavalry starting to rotate in for them now. Uh, trying to make a bit of a play with another storm ball, and this one connects nicely. But the flip back, just as Liming takes aim and connects at least the hit. I have to say that the blue team is actually starting to just pick Liming. Oh, that's a kill! <laughs> yeah, Jane, I was a bit too optimistic there. No, but as I was about to say, um, the interesting part for me is that with the uh, picks that we are seeing here right now, we have actually. Uh, four kills against three, okay. We have actually a bit of a setup where Li Ming is getting picked more consistently for Disgusting. And this is something that we've talked about in the past. That every single time that Lava Color is on Li Ming, it feels that they just have a bit more... A bit more pressure in the team fights. It's more of a, like an X factor that can really take the battle. And thanks to the cooldown reset mechanic around Li Ming, of course, you can build up quite a bit of momentum. So I like that they actually adjusted to it. Now stage dive is in, level 10 abilities, and Skok is dead again. I'm not sure what to say here, but he is down once more. That's five kills against three. And so far, so good. I mean, they are actually doing fairly well with all of it. And with fairly well, I mean that they are currently in a position where they're not only taking kills, they're taking tributes, and they're also in a position where they now start to steal their opponents, their opponents' mercenaries away, they experience. Nice, arrow connect. Can they follow up though? Doesn't seem like it. Nano boost on Greymane in this case. They really want that camp. They really want the kills. But the camp is already stolen. And Backhold is about to fall. Backhold is down. Liming is chipping in too. And this is starting to become a bit nasty. It's still even experienced. So it's not too bad yet. But another tribute is spawning. And they are still missing their main tank. Whereas the bottom tribute, if channeled by the blue team, would also result in a curse against the Vikings. So we'll see if that's going to pan out for them. I mean, at this point, Gia is jumping out. Yeah, they have to try to interrupt this. At least once more. ETC with stage dive can always jump in if he needs to. He has the cooldown now back up. There's a lot of ult still ready for the Vikings, whereas on the blue team side, there's not all that much. There's the stage dive, starting to jump in. ETC's in trouble, gets taunted, and that's the end of him. Nice Blizzard connect here. And here comes the top keg play as the Panda goes in. Double kill. ETC and Lucio are both dead, and it is time to chase them down. Big arrow from Hanzo. Yep, European arrows connecting with four heroes here. And it's two tributes against two tributes right now. Nicely done, I gotta say. Yeah. Well played here. So, for the time being, what we're actually looking at is a red team that is starting to make their comeback happen. Now, of course, I always have to throw that out. There is still one player missing for the Vikings. They play with Galde Gulnar today because, as I mentioned during the draft, Marke is actually on a vacation. He's in, in Spain, to my knowledge. 
Uh, and this is a boss kill. This is the problem for the blue team now. They actually didn't go for their own boss. They might try and do that now, but it's already way too late, especially with Idrax being this low. He couldn't really get any damage in, and top boss is already claimed. So now the red team can easily rotate down to the bottom of the map and contest this one as well. And they would be fools not to. So this is going to be a very, very awkward spot right now. And it seems like the blue team is actually going to let it slide. They have the level 13 talent right now. Max Passion keeps the aggro up. They want it all of a sudden. And honestly, they might just be able to grab it. Uh, it seems like they're letting it... Yeah, letting it leash. And that's full HP. But the Tribute is spawning another 10. And ETC is currently trying to defend the top lane, but that fort is under a lot of pressure. Down at the bottom of the map, the position is already taken slowly but steadily by the Vikings as they make their play for Lucio. And Lucio is dead again. I'm a real boy. No, you're not. So the oversized minion goes down, and with all the slows against ETC, that might be another kill. Yes, that looks very much like it. Can he slide out? No, didn't have to cool down. And that's the curse. Curse against the blue team. Boss is still alive, so he's going to do even more damage up at the top. They're still looking for more kills. Bit of a top cake position here from Max Passion. As they go for it, boss could be taken now, of course, too. And that's exactly what they seem to be doing. Well, want to soak the experience. Probably going to take it on the way back and not really focus on it too early. They're already jumping over just to go for the keep directly. With three heroes alive only, they can definitely do that. Uh, if you look at the minimap, Jaina is currently sitting in mid lane. And is doing her job there. Has escorted a whole minion wave for one and a half into it. So the structures are going to fall there for sure. Bottom is also going to fall. The fort that is. So on a structural perspective, they are taking a massive dump on Disgusting right now. Yeah, there's a slide. Gia, still fine. No 16 talents. 13 versus 13 talents, actually. Middle, the fort is about to fall. Top lane, the keep is soon going to be in trouble. Yeah, and here's the stage dive again. Immediately into the damage from Jaina. Nano boost helping out here. And the blue team is losing more and more ground, but the curse is finally over. Still, the wall over here taken down. In the middle of the map, a similar picture. The fort destroyed. And a bit of a, a couple of scratches over here. And down to the bottom of the map. More aggression! As they're starting to jump in for more and more damage here. Alright! Uh, the setup that we see for the Vikings is pretty fantastic. Eight kills against six. Pretty solid. And that's level 16 talents, of course, for them. Which means it's a massive spike. I mean, it's honestly a mad spike at this point. If you have a talent advantage this late in the game, it's always incredibly difficult for the opponent's team to come in for the battle. They still try, but that was a brilliant combo from Garrosh, a good taunt, and the follow-up was just absolutely spot on. They still uh, go for the boss, they keep the aggro, but they get the kill against Muradin too. Disgusting is falling apart a little bit here. They actually started really well into the early game, but now they're going for Itrex too. He's trying to jump out as much as he can using the angle, but there's another setup against him and he is dead. And guys, this is looking like game. This is really looking like game. That bot lane push is going to be absolutely monstrous. And then on top of it, we have the boss coming in. It's only 12 minutes into map number one, but that still means that we have the core attack directly. They're not going to stop at the keep here. It's another 22 seconds until we have Hanzo back. So despite the fact that we will at least have four heroes back to business, without one of the damage dealers, there is a good shot that they can take the core down. And if they won't be able to, then at least they will do a lot of damage to it. Also, Panda has the top keg back up in just a few seconds. ETC, nearly dead. Ooh, boy. Now, Hans has top damage in the game, but that doesn't really help you if you can't get the kills anymore. 11 kills against 6 in the mid game. It was pretty much dead even, but now the situation changes completely. Hanzo... Veni Vidi PP. He came, he saw, and he peed his pants. Immediately dead again, and that is game. 40% on the core, everybody else focusing on it, and that's the lead now that we see Li Ming die too. That's obviously the 1-0 in the best of five here as the Vikings take the advantage position in the best of five series in Division S Europe.
Okay, game number two, ladies and gentlemen. We are on Volskaya Foundry as we're heading into the game. And boy, did that late game not look good for uh, disgusting. The Vikings got a lot of snowball there, and they just used it mercilessly. So that was a pretty brutal setup, I gotta say. I was a little bit surprised by that too, but now that we're looking at map number two, Volskaya Foundry is, of course, changing things slightly. Uh, well, it doesn't really change it too much on the band pattern. We have a couple of heroes that are still pretty much identical to what we've seen previously. So, for example, Deathwing gets still banned out, but the adjustment on the panda, that's definitely a bit new. So, they made sure that Chen is eliminated for this one. And Ana gets banned as well. Okay, so no Nano boost in game number two in our best of five series. But again, Volskaya Foundry, there's a couple of other heroes that we could definitely see as well. Just one name that of course comes to mind immediately is Rexa. With Misha and the control, they have a good chance to hold that point a bit longer. There's other heroes. Uh, Zerit, who's still banned out, by the way. So that is very consistent. Yeah, and this time they didn't go for that, for that um, Mephisto ban that we saw previously. So, let's have a quick look there. What else are we going to get with this? Uh, yep, there's Malfurion. Okay. So, him as the first pick. Yep. What else on top of that? Need a little bit more action with this. Du -du -du. Du -du -du -du. The drafts in general in those two games have been a little bit slow, especially at the beginning. You would usually expect the teams at least to come in like just swinging with the first picks and setting the combo up, but not so much in this one. So Vala and Oriel get picked, so uh, this is pretty much what I'm talking about. If you go for Vala Oriel combo, at least you already have, you know that the, the, the you've pretty much set the tone for the rest of it. And that's kind of what we're looking at right now. So Vala Oriel set up the <laughs> Zarya gets picked away. Okay, love a Carlo and Zarya. That makes it makes it interesting. Definitely Zarya is a hero that is very popular on this map now too. And it would have been fantastic for the Swedes to have Zarya together with his setup. Then you get the extra shields, of course. And sustain. But doesn't quite work out that way. Now, my question then immediately is, what is Disgusting gonna pick together with Zarya? Who's the hero that really gets the bubble, right? Garrosh gets banned out because of the speed barrier on level 4, so you don't want to allow for that Zarya and Garrosh combo to come up against you. There's Uther banned out because with Vala and Oriel, there's a good chance that a second support is coming in, and Uther is so far, like, the support if you're gonna go into a double support setup. He's always like that second support that comes in for you. But, let's see. Yeah, they are hesitating here a little bit. They pick Mephisto after all! Alright! No mark and no problem. Mephisto is picked after all, so that ban in game number one definitely justified. So far it was always just simply Maka that said, look, okay, I have a lockdown on that hero. But at this time, it seems like Skog is going to get his shot at outdoing Maka here. We have also Tyriel now as our main tank for the Vikings, which actually means that they would probably love to have a bit more sustain. So either Rexa or Blaze, I'd say. Both of them would be okay here. Murden and Thrall! Okay, the heroes for Disgusting with the potential Trash Lightning pick on level 1 for Thrall. If he's going to be part of that 4 mana at the beginning and then has a chance to also continue stacking on the objective fights, that would help him. But Max Passion, what are we going to get on the offlane? Honestly, from my perspective, there's two possibilities. Either you play that with um, with um, Blaze for the bunker, or you go into Rexa, and you just like try to always poke in with Misha, keep the control for as long as you can. Ragnaros is not really a hero that ha I had on the agenda for this one, but I'll take it. It's a bit of a wild setup that we're seeing from the Vikings. It's not quite what I expected here, especially after we saw Vala and Oriel opening, heading into Mephisto and Ragnaros as follow-up heroes, not something that you see all that much. But I'm totally game, so let's jump in and see where this is leading. Game number two, Volskaya Foundry. Game number two, Volskaya Foundry. And we go in with Disgusting against the Vikings here, our second map. Lava Kalon Zarya for the blue team. Atrax on Liming, Satuas on Thrall. We have Rutek on Malfurion and Birch on Muradin. 
For the red team, Galdegulna on Oriel. We have Max Passion on Ragnaros. Burger aka Backhult on Tyriel. And Skok on Mephisto with Gia on Vala. And especially the Ragnaros pick is going to be interesting. I mean, theoretically, when you think about bringing the game into, or map in general, into the late game, Ragnaros is one of those heroes that can make it happen. Simply because the Molten Core is such a fantastic tool to defend against an objective like an Immortal. Punisher, or in this case, the Protector. The Trolling Thunder on level 1 for Thrall. Talent has, of course, been buffed in the recent patch. Was it the last patch? Was it the one before? I think it was the recent one, right? And is now even more useful than it was previously. Has a few additional bounces now as well. Actually, one. And is picked a lot more often, especially if you find yourself in the one-on-one -on -one lane that you deem to be quite important here. Now, as we are already starting to head into the one minute mark, we will see the teams go for the turrets. Ah, Mephisto is nearly down. <laughs> That's a lot of aggression against him already. Burger on the money pick, as you should. But the question just is, can Skog really deliver on that Mephisto? Good whip into the wall, nice! Into the tower, actually. That was a good stun. Ah, that can always lead to a kill if you don't pay attention. But now it's time for the items. Time to shine on items. Galdegul now and Gia both jumping in over on the left side. You can already see Lavakal and Rutek are doing the exact same thing pretty much. Trying to get the turret for themselves. Nobody really dealing with the healing beacon just yet. Still on level 1, by the way, as we're talking about it. We have also now the maximum charge for Zarya. So no feel the heat, no particle grenade setup. Different momentum for her. And with Zarya around, they actually don't even go for this. The camp was taken a bit late at the bottom of the map. So now they have a turret too, but they let this item slide. And that means that they are now down one, uh, one item. And here in Beacon. To be absolutely exact here, but yeah. Yeah, things will go be a little bit tricky on the first objective because of that. Or could be, in theory, at least. Now with Vala continuing with the multi-shot build here. She has at least the AoE that they need, the wave clear, and can also, on the objective itself, hit multiple heroes with that, of course. Pretty hard. Trump for raid on level 4. Standard for Liming by now. Well, not really standard. All four... Uh, sorry, all three talents in level 4 are still totally valid. But, yeah, that's probably the most common right now. Either way... It's going to be the big fight over objective number one that is already going to set the pace of the game. There's a lot of momentum that you can build up with it. You always want to prepare for the second objective. And then with the objective number two, you want to prepare for the third. So there's actually a lot that they can do with all of this. But yep, top side. A bit more aggression against Lavakal here. Gia needs to be a bit careful, but he's getting the damage connected. And a lot of it, at that, I might add. Problem is Murden is coming in, but he misses the Storm Ball. That's a problem. Vala is still on the run, gets a heal, and she's completely isolated into that corner. But they're trying to get the kill, and they nearly do. Itrux is about to go down, and so is, by the way, Lavakal. Both of them are incredibly low, but they're able to make it out of harm's way. And that's actually a pretty sweet deal for them, because they didn't use any of their items. Whereas the Vikings dropped their turret in that spot. So this is not... that's not nothing. Nobody died, but... Everybody had a fountain still up, and now we have two items against zero for the actual battle here. And that's a problem. I mean, it seriously is. So as you can already tell, they're all starting to make the plays over here. Yeah, still at the bottom of the map. That's where we have Max Passion now rotating in two, and with level 7 talents for both teams available. The Vikings get at least the initial start, but we have Ancestral Wrath now. We have the Heavy Impact. We have, I mean, Calamity. It's a huge power spike on level 7 now for the blue team. And they use that immediately to go for Gia. And that's a kill. Last hit connected. And he's down. 99% on the objective for the Vikings. But that doesn't mean shit if you can't get the final one. So they have all the time in the world to wait for, La for Bala to come back. That's obviously true. So that's not going to be the problem here. But still, it's tricky. I mean, it seriously is. Blue team has now a shot of getting the first protector. And they, of course, want to tie the series here. Going to game number three with an even score would be the dream. They might be able to make that happen. But it's a five versus five again, as I already mentioned previously. More items on the line, and this one gets stolen away. Or does it? Yep, they take it. Nothing gets dropped. Actually, they don't have it yet. My bad. Ah, uh, now they do. 
And the Stormbolt connects as well, so now he's sitting on six stacks. That's three items. That's a lot. They should be able to claim this one. Especially if they get the kill against Vala in. Which they don't. There's still a lot of poke happening with Mephisto and with Vala. But the healing beacon is keeping everybody in play here. Uh, this isn't easy. Okay, there's the connect again. Satra's making it in. Yeah, Ragnaros by now also committing to the Molten Core. Okay, with the trade, can zone them out a bit. Nice damage here from Vala as they're trying to go for it, but it's Teriel who falls first. Oh, but he's not the only one. Nope. Malfurion dies too, and losing the support is a problem. That takes all of the sustain that you had previously away from you. Nagia misses the arrow, but he still is able to connect a couple of the auto attacks here, and Max Passion is back to business now too. We don't have any of these teams on level 10 yet, but it's only half a level that's missing for disgusting, but oh oh, disgusting with one kill, two kills, and Gia makes it out. But there's no doubt anymore who's walking away with protector number one in this. So yep, easy win for them. There we have it, and of course the immediate focus into the middle of the map with level 10 abilities. And the Protector taking the wall down and then rotating towards the top side to eliminate the Fountain. Yeah, pretty similar to the last game actually. Disga in the sense that Disgusting it gets a bit of a lead here. But level 10 ability has turned it for the Vikings in the previous game. So let's find out if they can pull that off again. Thrall, by the way, with Sundering. Which is very interesting because normally you will see Earthquake being picked nearly exclusively. But if you play with Sundering, you're more so thinking about flanking in against your opponent and push them back. There's of course a couple of tools or a couple of moments where they can be kind of nice. If Strafe is being used and you drop a good Sundering that really helps you. Same is also true when Ragnaros is attempting to use the Molten Core. So there's a lot of potential interrupts that we could see with this. But we'll have to wait and check that out. Also in good old fashion, Lava Wave sucks. And that's why Sylphora Smash is being picked. There's not a lot of stuns though. I mean he really has to be on point with this. There are, of course, a couple of uh, situations where here, for example, if you just wait until the fight for this uh, erupts in earnest, you can actually come in and take it down pretty easily with a, or get, get value out of the Sulfuras, especially if you follow up on a stun like this one. Yep, there's already a bit of damage. That Sulfuras did do very little. The kill against Vala is absolutely true, though. Five kills against one. And off we go. Sanctification keeps them in play. And there's the kills, another one against Vala, down goes Tyriel, and with Muradin jumping in, using the heavy impact to slow them down, it seems like we could even see a kill against Mephisto, but it's not quite the case, instead Muradin dies, he misses the Stormbolt and then he gets eliminated. Seven kills against two though. Ah, said in the draft, it's a little bit of a wild combo for the Vikings, they really went out there. And so far, it did not work out. I mean, not even close, if we're honest. 28,000 damage for Vala and for Mephisto. Then again, Li Ming her by herself has already 32,000, so that's a really nice boost. Seven kills against two. They're heavily ahead now. That level 13 talent might just be enough to guarantee them maybe a few more items or just a good position for the objective up at the top. There's a lot that they can theoretically do with this. Okay. I mean, Gia is still holding on to the lane experience, but as I said previously, they're absolutely losing ground here. As our level 13, we have of course with the level 4 talent already mirrored in preparing for healing static on level 13, so he's gonna have a lot more sustain when he goes in deep, and with heavy impact, that's exactly where he wants to be. Jumping in, trying to slow everybody down for the rest of the team to follow up and get the real kills in. So he is gonna be able to do a whole lot of work here. And the action continues. Uh, 7 kills against 2, 13 versus 13. Top side hasn't been announced yet, but it's only going to be a matter of time. And let's go. Yeah, another Stormbolt connects, and yeah, he makes it out. But it's not too shabby, because at the end of the day, it just simply means that Muradin got another stack for his baseline. He's already sitting at 18, so he's actually doing a really good job this time stacking his baseline quest and that will allow him eventually to get the cooldown reduction on the auto attacks and pierce which is just a huge boost i mean it's insane if he just is diligent about that he might get it by the end of objective number two i would expect that we see a long and drawn out fight over it again so there is definitely that possibility okay zarya 
completes our own quest, so that's also important. Has a level 7, gone straight into the explosive barrier here. For Thrall and for Muradin, that's great. And the unstoppable competitor. So especially if uh, Muradin gets it when he jumps in, that's going to give him a lot of safety. Makes the entire play just so much easier for him. But here's the objective, and the blue team takes it a little bit early. Keep that experience lead in mind. It's nothing insane, but it's half a level. If this is a long and drawn out fight that ends with level 16 for the blue team, there's a chance that they can force a battle around that talent advantage. And now it's a 5 versus 5. They're already starting to take the position here. Tyrell is jumping in. Yeah, they need a good setup right now. So far the team fights haven't really gone well for the Vikings. This is an opportunity to turn it around. And honestly, they won't have a lot of those left. So now they go for Mirrodin. Avatar is already getting used. Combo misses. Tranquility is out as well. That's a lot of used heroic abilities. A lot of them. And if they can't get anything as a trade, then they're in trouble. But they might get the kill against Tyrael. Sanctification keeps him alive. Lavakal is on the run. Muradin jumps in again for the slows, for the Stormbolt. And the kill against Vala. Yep, there's at least a counter kill against Zarya. So that's nice. Malfurion also nearly eliminated. But he is able to make it out. So that fight isn't over by any means yet. But with the Resurrect available, Vala is going to be back to business in just a moment. And Gat gives the red team the edge again. With Mirrodin still hammering those storm balls. He's one... Oh, Liming. Ooh, gets caught there and dies. Yeah, yeah, that's a problem. Mirrodin is one single stack away from completing his quest, so that's fantastic for him. But now 8 kills against 4, level 16, any second for both teams. Yep, there we have it. And the healing beacon. So, red team has started to not only fight their way back into this, but they're also taking a lead. Uh, level 16 talents, as usual, on Oriel's side. Will of Heaven! The attack speed increase for Vala. And Burgeon is murdered. is actually playing super aggressive here. There's his quest completed, so now he has also Pierce available. Can be really, really nice in those choke point fights. And Li Ming is still trying to follow us up. And again, I'm coming back to my, my earlier point. This time it might not be Lavakal who plays Li Ming, it's Itrax, but still, whenever they play with Li Ming, they are in a pretty decent spot here, and they just show that aggression that we are out of sight of that, oftentimes missing. Protector is in, and let's see what they're actually going to do with this. It seems like they're going to try and prepare for objective number three. So they're already on the rotation down towards the bottom of the map. Could do a little bit of a drive-by uh, in the mid lane, which is exactly what they do. Taking down that fountain. Yeah, maybe even the entire fort. Bot lane is still not attacked though, so they're losing all of the HP on the Protector. So this will definitely result in the bottom, in the mid fort taken down if they want to. But it's also a bit of an issue because nobody's really homing in on the bot lane yet. The problem is that Thrall is engaged in a battle against Ragnaros and didn't see the rotation coming. So now he's going to fall. That's a gank that he did not anticipate. Uses his ult as well. So that's another cooldown that just got burned. Bit unlucky for him to be fair. Because he was thinking that he was in a one-on-one -on -one situation against Ragnaros. But as it turns out, the Vikings don't respect the one-on-one. -on -one. Big shout out to Alex the Pro G. He always respected the one-on-one -on -one when he won it. Uh, but down at the bottom of the map, there's of course the elimination of the fort is imminent. And yeah, it's it's really that late game setup where the Vikings are just way more coordinated than their opponent. It showed in game number one and it's showing in game number two. This isn't over by any means, but you can tell that the momentum is slowly starting to shift here. And this is just because a lot of experience that we have for the red team and them just being a bit better coordinated in those fights towards the later stages. And it's problematic, disgusting, especially in the Protector fight topside, used their ults very, very early. They were nearly non-used for the Vikings, and that led to a fight where one team pretty much had no heroic abilities that they could use any longer. And of course, rotations like this matter as well. The fort is at least taken down, so there's a bit of counter value throughout all of this. But push in the middle. Maybe a little bit too aggressive, even. In terms of damage output, we have 52,000 from Mephisto. Uh, 42,000 from Bala, so that's still quite a bit. Alright, so a little setup down here. B -b 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 burger and that's a sanctification. Okay, already Ragnaros is shelling away. Misses the Sulphurus, does a bit of damage, but the stun definitely doesn't connect. Uh, Stormbolt is in. 
And the kill against Mephisto. Can they get more? I guess the answer is no. Resurrect is still up, by the way. So, in theory, they could sneak over to Mephisto and revive him. It's always a cooldown question. Ooh, Gia pausing the game here. Maybe they're having a few more problems. Not sure if that affected the Mephisto kill or not. But it gives us an opportunity to go over a couple of talents and also just look at the damage real quickly. So, Mephisto himself with 57,000 damage, but with four deaths on Vala, you can already tell that for Vala it's problematic that she gets focused here the entire time. And, ooh, that was a short one. And one of the problems is, of course, that that setup at the front with Ragnaros and Tyrion is not really the best setup if you want to have Vala save. There's a reason why oftentimes with Vala we see heroes picked like, let's say, ETC, who is in a position that, where he can create space for Vala. None of the heroes that we have here can really do that outside of Oriel using a whip, so that's a problem. Oriel, by the way, also using the Resurrect over here. And other heroes that usually are kind of nice with this are Johanna with Condemn or just simply Garrosh who can either flip Vala away from the opponent or just throw the opponent away instead. So all of these things just don't exist. So that makes Gia's life a bit harder since he is always heavily attacked here. Muradin has slows whenever he jumps in and makes the engage and there's so much follow-up with the roots in particular that it's really tricky. Now the red team gives up the healing beacon. It's level 19 and a half versus 19 and a half on the other hand, so it should actually be a fight with Storm Talents for both teams over objective number three, which very likely is not going to end the game. Unless one team is just completely wiping here and gains an insane amount of momentum, we should see a fourth objective coming in. So far, we have still forts on the map. No keep has been eliminated yet either. So that's another thing. Uh, but here we go. 20 versus 20, any second. And again, the early lead for the red team as the Vikings take the position. Vala is going to have the far flight quiver together with Mandikor on level uh, 16. So it's going to be an insane setup now for Gia. He's going to be so much safer. Honestly, this might just be the total game changer for Vala. Having that safety now is going to be fantastic. The heroic difficulty is in for Ragnaros, which gives us now the cooldown reduction. Battle Arena also taken. There's a lot of incredible power spikes on level 20 now available for them. Now, of course, you look over to the blue team and we have Rewind, which in and of itself is fantastic. Tal Rasha, Serenity. There's a lot of really good tools too. Talk about good tools. <laughs> that was something that Rack didn't see coming. He at least dropped the item so it didn't get passed over. Aureal could try and sneak in for the Resurrect. She has the cooldown ready. Mirrodin missed the Storm Ball. That could have been an additional kill. If he hits that, that is likely a kill. And Galnegul now has to decide if he wants to go for the Resurrect up at the top now. I don't really think that they're going to give this one up lightly. 40 seconds over here. Everybody is just jumping out. Doesn't really seem like they're interested in resurrecting Ragnaros. Nope. I mean, rumor has it that he said a couple of nasty things about Aureal's mom. But I can neither deny nor confirm that. So, just a rumor, you know. 10 kills against 5 though, put the, own, uh, put the owners in team fights and the aggression heavily in the hands of Disgusting. And well, that is going to hurt here. 9 seconds, 8 for Ragnaros, travel time included. They might just be able to force a fight here if they YOLO it. But I don't really think so. I mean, this is too close. Okay, he's jumping in, he's trying to contest, but he does actually not hit the spot. <laughs> he was just outside of the range, and that's a kill against Tyrael for absolutely nothing. And yeah, not quite sure what to say here. Now at least Ragnaros comes in and helps them to defend with a Molten Core, but oh boy, this is starting to... Uh, well, maybe not turn quickly, but they are in a world of trouble right now because everything just went completely wrong in that last fight there. Tyrael's idea of delaying it a bit more for Ragnaros and Vala to make their way over and fight with them was definitely not a bad one. But then him uh, misjudging the distance a little bit. I don't necessarily want to call it misplaying. The idea was there. He was just not close enough to it. But that became a very big problem very, very quickly. So now they are in a situation where they might lose the keep at the bottom of the map and maybe even a little bit more depending on how this is going to work out. Yeah, already the attack right there, but they couldn't even get the keep. 
What? I mean, it was good poke against it, but they couldn't get the keep, of course, having... As I said at the beginning of the game, if you actually have a setup in which you are running the game with the Molten Core from from Ragnaros, you can actually defend against a lot of objectives, yeah, but boy, that fight, that position, Oriel is down, Zarya with her ult completely, completely driving a wedge between them, double stun now from Muradin, oh my god, what didn't work with the Protector surely works afterwards, Galigulna is about to go down on Oriel again, yep, Four kills against three, though. Mephisto, what the fuck? Mephisto, what looked like it could potentially even be game ending, was turned around as Mephisto comes in and just drops them. I mean, literally just drops them one after another. Four heroes eliminated by Mephisto. It's honestly bonkers. The fight started off so well for Disgusting. Zarya's ult was fantastic. They had the kills afterwards. Muradin just took advantage of the position in which the fight happened with one double storm bolt after another, getting the pierce through time and time again. And then just as it looked like the blue team might even be able to end the game with a team wipe and move down to the bottom of the map where the keep has, of course, already taken damage. All of a sudden, it's a total comeback. <laughs> Mephisto pops off. I mean, that was nuts. That was absolutely nuts. <laughs> yeah, now we're looking at 15 kills against 9. But 22 versus 22. We're 21 minutes into this game. Guys, this is getting a little bit bananas here. I did not see that coming after this fight. I mean, <laughs> Mephisto just getting the mad damage out was the big game changer here for them. That could have been over. But it's still uh, it's still such a tight one. Uh, Birch is pausing the game now. Okay, they seem to have some issues. Doesn't seem like anybody actually disconnected, but it is... There's, I mean, there's definitely adrenaline pumping. Look at the damage I put on Mephisto. He's at 105,000 hero damage. His spike in the last battle was absolutely crazy. He's 40,000 damage ahead of Vala now. And Vala has been dropping a lot of damage in. Has had a lot of trouble keeping herself alive, as I already went over multiple times now. With Muradin being this aggressive and the follow-ups always there, it's definitely not an easy easy game for Vala, so Gia has trouble there. But the damage I put on Mephisto just snowballing like this, holy moly. Four kills in that last engage. Now top side, this is where the fort is gonna get attacked. We have a pretty big wave and also minions, uh, mercenaries coming in. So that will do some damage here. It's all about the next objective pretty much. And honestly, I mean, the fourth objective usually ends the game. I've seen so far one time, I, I've, I've never seen the fifth objective actually winning the game. I've seen once the fifth objective being fought over and the fifth objective being taken, but as it happened, the opponent's team just rushed the core and won the game then instead. So I've never actually seen protector number five attacking the core. But as you can imagine, when that happens, that bad boy is just dropping incredible damage in. The fourth one is already difficult to deal with. With the uh, abilities, by the way, we still have one quest talent that hasn't been completed yet. The repeated offense on the side of Oriel has so far <laughs> not been connected here. Which is kind of interesting because especially initially, uh, he did a fantastic job connecting one stun after another. But that definitely fell off a little bit as the game continued. Uh, Mirrodin still with those storm bolts and uh, whatever the problem is, it has been resolved. That catapult down here needs to be taken care of. Uh, keep in mind, 22 minutes into the game, catapults are hitting like trucks now. It's honestly winion time. If you get catapults on your keep, core, whatever, it's gone. Like, there's no way of saving that. Ah, well, here's the objective. Objective number four, straight in the middle. So let's have a bit of a shot to see how this is going to pan out for them. What are we going to get with this? I mean, Max Passion is currently sitting at the top. Tyrael needs to be careful. Mirida and Tyrael. Storm Bolt set up. Oh! <laughs> Burger! And there it is! The ult! The double kill! Two kills in. The Sanctification came through. They're trying to get the third kill, and they do. Thrall is down. Easy triple kill. Oh my god, and that was another clutch one. Let's be honest about this. This could have been the end of Tyrael, and if he falls, then there's a big lead, of course, for Disgusting. But they lose three heroes in short succession. 
as we have Tyrael turning it around, sanking behind them, allowing the entire team to jump in aggressively. And now the Vikings, they are trying to barrel through the mid lane, trying to take that down while Ragnaros still goes for the objective. If they open up the mid lane, take the keep apart, they will definitely be able to go for core here. We are 23 minutes in. Those objectives, they hit so hard right now. The Protector is going to do mad damage. And even before the Protector comes in, they're already moving towards the core, and for good reason. Death timers are, of course, incredibly high this late in the game. So now that they're jumping in, we see the uh, well, catapult, by the way, is already on the quad. As I said, catapults are actually doing serious work now. So Lavakal and Rutek have the word already, work already cut out for them, trying to deal with the heroes. But catapults do even more. I mean, look at this. Boom, that's four points off the core with a single catapult shot. Four percentage points. It's at 71 now. And here comes the protector. And that should definitely be the end of game number two. I mean, seriously. 120,000 damage on Mephisto. Get the hell out of there. <laughs> Insane damage numbers. And try to burn it down as quickly as they can, and for good reason. Keep also in mind that whenever Tyrael explodes, he's going to take another 5% roughly off the core. But look how hard this thing hits. It's insane. And well, that's game number two. The Vikings with a 2-0 lead in the best of five series against Disgusting GG. And well played as they take the W and will sky a foundry. Towers of Boom, ladies and gentlemen, game number three, and oh boy, do we see the Mephisto ban? <laughs> After the Vikings and Skog in particular pretty much just dominated in those last two team fights, it was a bit insane. I mean, it was seriously sick. <laughs> that Mephisto quad kill was just next level, I don't know what to say. So now we have a big lead in the best of five for the Vikings, so a 2-0. And the big question is, of course, can they make that a 3-0? Can they win the entire series without even dropping a single map? Or are we seeing Disgusting fighting back here? Because the thing with Disgusting is, you look at the early game and you look at a lot of players that are made and they're actually making the right moves. They're oftentimes even ahead in kills, have a really good position, but then the late game happens. And that's why all of a sudden, I, I don't know, it feels like sometimes I'm a little bit anxious when it comes to the team fight. Sometimes it's just bad luck. And sometimes it's a bit of inexperience when they make their rotations. But generally speaking, it's heartbreaking to see them just do so well in the early game. Oftentimes also in the mid game. And then struggle in the late game and lose the game there. So it always feels like they at least deserve to win a few maps. If not some series. Against the Vikings, they've been doing a great job so far, but you look at the result at this point and it doesn't seem like it, right? A 2-0 seems pretty clean. Uh, far from it, though. Uh, but here we go. <laughs> the Mephisto ban. I can't blame them. I honestly don't know if they would have gotten for Mephisto, but can you blame them after the last game that they are banning the hero out? And keep in mind, they actually banned him in the first map. Uh, on the first map, and then on the second, they were like, ah, not really. And then Mephisto wins the game so yeah that was unfortunate uh okay so anna early pick again mm, i mean what are they opening up with now towers of doom you can against again play the global play if not Malthale for the top mid rotation would be great leo in that position is really strong you can put blaze into it for me, it's actually surprising that we haven't seen Blaze once yet in that series. Neither have we seen Leoric, so that's a bit of a problem. But not, not a problem, but it's, it's a bit weird. I mean, Leo, for example, the other day was cons consistently first picked. Ooh, Zaratul for Gia. And Jaina! Now, Zaratul isn't really played with Void Prison into Ring of Frost anymore. That's a bit old school. It's weird to call it old school, but I mean, it is kind of the case. It hasn't really played that particular setup hasn't been played for seven eight nine months now doesn't mean that you can't do it though so they can definitely still make that play but you don't have to we've actually seen games where Zaratul and Jaina were played where Void Prison wasn't chosen where instead they went into Might of the Nerezim Zaratul was still trying to attack the backline and Jaina just did her thing with Anna played by Galnagul Na you obviously have now also the Nano boost so if you control all three and you go in Void Prison then you have an insane wombo combo with incredible damage 
So that is definitely an option. Li Ming gets banned out, and this comes back to what I said about disgusting draft pattern, that they're actually starting to focus more on Li Ming as part of their composition. And now she gets targeted for that reason. Jimmy and Greymane. Okay, so both of them in. Good auto attack damage. Not a lot of AoE for them right now. They're a little bit short on the AoE. Ooh. Space Goat is in the game. We have Urel taken. Okay, Max Passion. Hobbity hop, baby. But yeah, there's not a lot of AoE. When it comes to Wave Clear, Greyman is probably their best tool, but they really, really should pick now a side laner that is able to take at least two lanes and can make the rotation. Again, Leo, Malthael, Blaze. They need to get some. Like, if they pick a Thrall here, they are going to be in trouble eventually. Ah, Imperius. Okay, fair enough. Imperius can also do some work here. As another stun as a follow-up. Ah, I mean, they have Muradin, Stormball. They have Imperius with a lunge. Malfurion with a lockdown. And then a lot of damage there. I gotta say, they could run into some problems here, though. though. Okay, let's go into game number three of the series. Towers of Doom, ladies and gentlemen. Division S, the best of five. Maybe even the last map of the match. Let's jump straight in. Game on! Viking time! Alrighty, off we go. Disgusting against the Vikings on Towers of Doom on the left side. Lavakal on Reyna. And we have Itrax on Greyman, Rutek on Malfurion, Birch on Murden, and Sartos on Imperius. And to the right side of the map, the Vikings with Max Passion on Urel. We currently have Gia on Zeratul, Galnguna on Anna, Skog on Jaina, and Berger, aka Backhult, on Johanna. Alright, off we go. So, big question, or the one question that we still have is level 10 abilities. Are we going to see a Bombo combo attempt by Zeratul and Jaina? Again, we've seen the combo, uh, the combo between the two heroes quite a lot, but recently mm, a lot of players don't even go for Wombo anymore. The problem that they have with the Wombo combo is oftentimes that when it fails, you're two, three cooldowns down and you have problems winning the fight there. So there's a lot of things that you can do to also interrupt it. Just simply zoning out either Jaina or preventing Zeratul from releasing the Void Prison at a perfect moment in time. Some of those good tools and Zeratul these days is so incredibly strong with a proper build that he can pretty much destroy the opponent's backline single handedly, so you're not reliant on that Wombo anymore. But it's an option, especially with Anna, of course. And so we'll see what the decision is. For the time being, though, we have start up with a Greater Cleave. So normally you see Cleave talents taken with a current build on level 1 and level 16. Nothing else. Hold your ground on level 1 for. Johanna and the space code is gonna do her thing up at the top now for the rest of the team for the four man It will most likely be a very heavy focus onto the bot lane You want to make sure that you take at some point your opponent's bell tower there So you can escort those pumpkins straight into the opponent's core, which is highly important and a huge advantage But yeah over here a little bit of body blocking and Skog was in a bit of trouble not enough to seriously threaten him, I guess. Oh, <laughs> Atrox going deep, though. But that's going to be a kill. Ah, no, Johanna can actually not close the gap here. Okay, but that was dangerous. They started off well and nearly took Jaina down, or at least put Jaina in a bit of an awkward spot where she had to try and get out through the top. But then the rotation was hitting them hard, and they nearly lost too. Now, Skog isn't caught twice, so he already realizes that there's someone rotating towards the bottom of the map, so he's starting to fall back from the minion wave. Level 4 talents are in. With that, we have now... Oh, actually, he continues with it. Randy and Cleave on level 4 as well. Okay. Ah, a bit of a different setup than what we are seeing from players like Dainu and uh, Tai, and others too. So, yep, Gia going more into a full cleave build here. We're going really old school here. Okay. Uh, Muradin with two stacks so far. Gets a third one, but of course the iron skin prevents the stun. Still gets the damage through, but yeah, well, as you can imagine, want a little bit more out of this one. Okay, what else are we gonna have here? T -t 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 Burgess currently sitting tight, top left, top right, the two altars, third one at the bottom of the map, that's usually the one that gets fought over. Not a single kill yet, uh, we had very aggressive games in the first and the second map, but now no kills yet, a bit of aggression in the middle though, and it tracks! 
don't tell me he gets away. There's no way. There's no way. No, he's dead this time. At the bottom of the map, it's a three versus three. And holy moly, Jaina walking out in the nick of time. Urel at the top left is actually trying to interrupt. Down here, Stormbolt, Muradin in trouble. Condemn and the kill. Shots get fired, though. Yeah, Imperius channeled the top left. And the attacks are still coming. So it's going to be eight shots fired against the blue team's core. First and second salvo connect. Two altars against one. And two kills against zero. Good start. Good start for the Vikings. And they want to make this a 3 0 series, then they're already off to a very good beginning here. But of course, they need a lot more. And this is still the comeback map for a good reason. If you at any point shift the momentum in the later stages of the game, when death timers are high, you can start to take down bell towers, you can maybe even go for boss. There's a lot of options that you have when you win a late game fight that you can pull off there. So we'll see. For now, level 7 talents are ready for the red team that gives them a lead and that's nearly allowed them to go over and steal the pumpkin camp away. But the blue team was just uh, quick enough to deal with that. And with level 7 we also have Seeker in the dark and the horsey! Divine Steed! Alrighty, Urel with the easy rotations between top and mid. Zaratul still occasionally stops by, not only to get the wave clear in, but also to of course set some attacks up against Imperius and other heroes to make that an even better trade for them. Ah, he himself gets locked in though, but Mirrodin is also in trouble. Went on level 1, by the way, again into the third wind. And this time we have Skullcracker. And Skullcracker is actually an interesting one with a stun setup, not only against Zaratul, but also against potential Wombos. So leaning more towards stunning the opponent out and including more tools in CC chain. Uh oh. That's a bad time to die. Not there's ever a good time. That's actually not true. There are good times to die. If, if you have to make a choice in the early game, that's where you don't really worry about it too much. Or after an objective has been claimed and then defeated. But now they have to give this one up pretty much for free. There's no contesting it. Not with Malfury, not there. Your support is kind of needed here. So that was a good catch by the Vikings. Leads to another four shots against the blue team. Which is now already falling behind by eight points on the core. And the more important part is probably the experience discrepancy between the two teams because an early level 10 could yield some dividends here also. They're still setting up this 2 versus 1, but Sartreus is able to get away. Yeah, good lunge. Lunged over, saved himself, brought himself a little bit closer to the 4. There was no following that. And here we go. Rotation return. Oh, there it is. Ring of Frost and the Void Prison. They go for it and they make it a bit more spicy. They go into the Falling Sword on Johanna. Yeah, it definitely feels like they are also memeing this a little bit. I mean, they're not dropping a Gazel or anything, but they are definitely going to in a very crazy Wombo Combo setup. And that can definitely work. I mean, this is going to get nasty. Zeratul is already in position. Haymaker! <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> you can meme, but we're going to meme you harder. Haymaker set up. Okay, are they going to try and go for the kill here? Yeah, they're dropping some free damage in as Muradin jumps out. Gia is still sitting tight. Is of course waiting for an opportunity to drop that VP. I mean, this entire combo, if it's executed properly, is just going to be nuts. And they don't even need it to get the kill against Muradin. Muradin is down. And that is again just as the two altars have been announced. And of course, the pumpkin camp is now up for grabs too. And there's a lot that's currently going wrong for them. There's a lot that happens that is not really to the in favor of the blue team. Quest completion on Jane as well. Ring! And it did enough to get the kill. And Zaratul could jump out. No void prison. No falling sword. The ring alone was all that they needed. Four shots fired as the top left got channeled. But Galne Gulnar is already on it. And is channeling the top right. Yeah, five kills against zero. The blue team is still waiting for the first kill to drop the first hero in the game. And so far, it doesn't really look too well. Uh, over here, still a rotation with the Skork in position to try and take the wall down. They're starting to rotate towards the top as well. In comes an attempt by Urel to stay alive. Yeah, hoppity hop and gets away. <laughs> and Divine Steed helps with it too, of course. 
Yeah, more aggression against Lavakal, but Malfurion is there too, but it keeps him honest. Uh, down to the bottom, there's still a 2 versus 2 setup as Muradin and Greymin were hoping to get the kill against Jaina in, but with Anna around, there's just no. Mm, there's, it's not happening. Okay. <laughs> the setup here is kinda insane. Alright, so up to the top, Gia, Verga, uh, Stormbolt, no consequence. Nine Stormbolt so far only that he connected, so that's nine stacks on the baseline. Not really as much as he was probably hoping for. I'm still waiting for Zeratul to drop that monster Void Prison. Oh, Haymaker, baby! And that's a kill. The Haymaker into the Mirfurian old Twilight Dream. And all of a sudden, this is turning against them. Yep, there's the Void Prison. No, my oh my god, he actually got out. <laughs> nice job by Gia. Defensive Void Prisoners, they're trying to get away. But that's the first blood for Disgusting. Ah, okay, guys, a bit of momentum for them. Still a level behind, but hey, here we go. And you can already tell that they're immediately starting to take some some, dam some damage on the structures. The red team, of course. And the objective is about to be up. Talking about up, you have five versus five on the map. Yeah, channel can come. Flashlight. Oh, nope, they're not going to get that. And again, Haymaker! <laughs> Well, I see a lot of playmaking perspectives here, so Muradin is actually getting the second kill. First it was the one against Anna. Can you imagine how this is going to look once that he actually has level 16 and can jump in a little bit deeper? He's actually doing really well on this. Double Haymaker, double kill. That's what we're looking at here. We have now two kills against five, so there is some momentum that the blue team is building up. Another Storm Bolt. He's at 50 now. Gets the extra stacks, of course, thanks to the kills that they connect after he stuns initially. <laughs> but yeah, this is actually starting to get a little bit insane. Muradin, is he able to make it happen again? I love the setup with Haymaker into Malfurion's ult. That was honestly disgusting. And they could get the kill easily after that. There was just no saving the target anymore. Uh, Anna is sniffing that out. No face checkerinos at this point. Okay. Urel at the top. Not getting stolen away here. <laughs> I mean, from the blue team's perspective, I totally get why they would want to fight now. I don't understand why the red team would try and go for a battle. They want level 16, which they now have. Now it's time to fight. Especially since the cleave build is, called, of course, even so much stronger right now. Okay. Starting to jump in against Lavakal. Nearly there. A little bit low. Birch is already looking for the playmaker move. Level 16 is a big deal now though. And it just comes in as we have three altars on the map. You get two, you're in a good spot. If the Vikings grab two, then they're going to be eight points ahead again. And of course, there's also the pumpkins to be considered since the bottom uh, bell tower has already taken some damage. Yeah, kill. Go jumps in, 24,000 damage, 11,000 from Muradin. There's the setup. Ring! Ring a ding! Down goes Imperius. No chance, Lance. But everybody else is a little bit low here, honestly. Gia and Skok are both low, but they get the kill against Greymane over to the left. Johanna, I still haven't seen that old use that. Now, jumping out. What is that? The no balls move by Backhold. Yeah, I don't like that at all. Backhold with the defensive. The defensive falling sword. I mean, what is this? Anduin? That's a, that's a weak-ass play that I would expect from Anduin. Jumping out of the fight? I'm honestly a little bit disappointed at this. Uh, I mean, seriously. For the memes, baby. Need to go in deep there. Well, now that we have 16 on both sides, the bell tower has been claimed by the Vikings. So they have a 5 versus 3 bell tower lead. And that means that the last channel on the altar is going to drop 5 points of the core. So it's a big win. But with level 16, we also now have the dwarf launch. So all of a sudden, there's even more haymaker pressure. There's a lot of haymaker pressure now. Is it going to be enough to come back into the game though? That's the question. 15 points on the core against 24. Ah. It's not hopeless, by any means. As I said previously, you win a fight in the late game and you have momentum. <laughs> Already! He's just jumping into... <laughs> 
Ah, there it is! Yes! The kill against Zaratul! Disgusting plays by the blue team. How many hop? He goes in again. Not only the golden Johanna can jump. Nope, he can too. Lavakal comes in with the notorious Jimmy flank. And oh boy, is that a game. <laughs> Storm bolt. And that's going to be a double. Oh no. Oh, Anna is down. And they actually saved everybody on the blue team side. For a moment, I thought we had another Mephisto moment where the blue team starts with the kills and then loses everything. But Jesus, that dwarf is fantastic. The balls on that midget. He just jumped into the shrub over there. <laughs> just full on YOLO. No fucks given. Gets the stun. Nearly dies. A Haymakers again straight into Malfurion's ult. They get the easy kill. And then they follow it up with the second one. I mean, seriously. Birch doesn't give a fuck here. He's just jumping across the map. That, <laughs> that dwarf is just fantastic. Jump after jump. Stormbolt after Stormbolt. It's just all day. YOLO all day, every day. 24-7. <laughs> He's the YOLO machine. But they lost the bell tower in the middle as they recovered the one at the bottom of the map. So uh, as fun as this is, let's not forget that the control on the macro level is still in the Vikings' hands. And they are close to level 20. Uh, but there's another star on Bolt and that's a kill. I mean, Jaina is dead. 100%. I honestly don't really know what they were doing there in the first place because they didn't have five heroes on the map. What are you doing there? What are you doing there? Ah, oh, well, you level 20 talents. This is like one of these things. You win the team fight, but you are behind bell towers, and that means that you are just only getting three shots connected. And do you guys remember what I actually told you at the beginning of the game when we were looking at the draft about the lack of wave clear on the blue team side? It's definitely a bit true. Look at the siege damage that we see from Ural and then compare that a bit to the solo layer on the other side with the 80,000 that we see from Imperius. They have trouble keeping up with the rotation and what that results in is the middle bell tower taken. They reclaim it now, but at the same time the one at the top is continuously getting pressured by these moves. And you now compare that over to that side, not even a single point of damage on those towers. Over here both are still standing as well. So as fun as this entire setup is that they're playing, and they're getting a lot done. I mean, they're really closing the gap already with 15 to 18 points on the core. But they, they, all of this comes with a bit of a caveat. It comes with a disadvantage. And that disadvantage is simply that in the long term, they're going to lose out on the lanes if Ural is being able to do all of that. There's the jump in, though, as uh, by now we have actually the Falling Sword being used, as it should be. Level 20 talents for both sides. And that pretty much puts it down to a team fight again. Now with the uh, level 20, we now have, first of all, execute and rewind for the second time. Sartreus is actually eating quite a bit of damage. He's currently looking for someone to drop the ult on. There's the Void Prison ring, and that's not enough, but look at that jump. Not only Zeratul comes in, but also Jojo. Three down, and yeah, they're gonna go for more kills, aren't they? They're looking for Imperius, and that's gonna be another kill. He used his ult already, he can't do anything here, and he is going to fall. If they want the kill, they'll get the kill, and indeed they do. Yeah, dodges out and everything, they get the kill here, they're jumping onto Atrex now, and that's another kill. Is that a five man wipe? Yeah! Ha <laughs> ha! It is! <laughs> Oh, in comes Johanna, and yeah, that should honestly be pretty much game. You take, the, well, yeah, they take this one, they take the one in the middle. Guys, they can go for the full barrage now. They can go down to the bottom of the map and simply take the last one, then get the double channel, and that's game 100%. So that last fight, again, just breaking my heart here. Disgusting, making the plays, having the fan for service ready for everybody. And then they're just getting absolutely murdered in the final fight. And that is pretty much the end of it. So at this point, they're starting to jump straight in on the last bell tower. The two altars are, of course, ready. But the barrage is starting. So this is checkmate. Checkmate right here. Nowhere to go. They need to make a move. But whatever move they make is going to be the wrong one. And if they don't do anything, they're losing out too. So they're trying to go for the altars. But Zaratul has already channeled the bottom. Look at that. That's six points. Yes, there's another kill. It's two heroes down. The quest is completed. That doesn't matter anymore either. The barrage is still ongoing. They will walk away with another kill against Muradin. Ha! <laughs> Memeing it with a VP even. But the shots are being fired. 
and Muradin is dead. Three points on the core, another shot any second. Yep, that's two points on the core now. And this is game. Credit to Disgusting. Again, it, I feel sorry for them. They always play nice, but then they are just not able to get those map and those match wins. A 3 0 victory for the Vikings in Division S Europe against Disgusting. GG. Well played. Thank you everybody for watching the video today. I hope that you enjoyed the show and the commentary. And keep in mind that the spoiler protection that is going to run for the rest of the video is made possible by all the support on Patreon.com. So guys, if you want to support my work, if you want to help me start new projects and keep the spoiler protection in place, please consider heading over to Patreon.com slash Kaldor. There's also a link in the YouTube description and check that out. Thanks in advance and see you guys next time with more esports coverage here on Color TV. Have a great day.